Hello and welcome to the Wildlife Rescue Podcast, an audio and video series about wildlife, the problems they face, and some of the solutions too. In this episode, two elephants, Maddie and Kanika, rescued from decades of misery and work, taken to their new home, the brand new Phuket Elephant Sanctuary in Thailand. The small island of Phuket is a popular tourist destination in Thailand and home to countless trekking camps where holidaymakers go to ride elephants. The Phuket Elephant Sanctuary is shaking up the status quo as the first of its kind in Phuket and hopes to make a big impact when it opens this year. Last month, they rescued their first two elephants. Phuket Elephant Sanctuary is Phuket's first elephant sanctuary, created as a partnership between Mr. Montre Toddan, ex-owner of an elephant camp, and two NGOs, Ears Asia and Save Elephant Foundation of the famous Elephant Nature Park in Chiang Mai. And normally, I'm the first to say that the world doesn't need new sanctuaries. There are so many already doing great work around the world. I meet a lot of people who want to open their own sanctuary, and quite often this is not the best use of everyone's time and money. But Phuket Elephant Sanctuary is aiming to do something different. Being located within a popular tourist location is renowned for elephant tourism. Uh, it means that they have the chance to capture people that may not otherwise seek out ecotourism or animal sanctuaries. Instead of uh, preaching to the choir like us who already know we should treat elephants nicely, they can help change the hearts and minds of people who just wanted to see elephants or just wanted to do something on their holiday but didn't know about the terrible conditions in the trekking camps that they would otherwise go to. Most sanctuaries that I've been to um, can take you know, a few uh, visitors at a time, maybe 10, maybe 20. You get the trekking camps in Thailand that run like a, a mini army. You've got hundreds of people coming in every day. And they have a huge influence, much more than the smaller sanctuaries and projects uh, dotted around Thailand. So this could be a big deal. Hopefully, by proving Phuket Elephant Sanctuary as a model, the other camps will see what the tourists really want. Madi is about 60 years old, Kanika is about 30 years old. Uh, they're both female elephants that have been working in logging and tourism for all their lives. Mr. Todde and their owner in the elephant business for decades, but now he feels there's a better way forward. It's another welcome sign of the slow but sure change in attitudes towards elephant welfare all over Thailand. At 6 a.m. we reach the trekking camp where the elephants are still living. Um, the camp's starting to set up for a very long day's work. After a couple of hours, the elephants are being fixed up with big metal frames on their backs. It takes them a few minutes. It was quite fascinating to watch them load up these elephants. Some of these frames, depending on where you go, are really very heavy. Some of them are hollow and not so heavy for the elephants. Some of them use a lot of padding underneath. Like the place we visited, they, they had, I don't know, 10 layers of padding under the heavy frame add another four or five tourists at once onto their back and regardless of how much padding you have that's a lot of work all day long for the elephants. You can see actually from some of the footage that I took um, the marks on the elephant's back where they do have this thick padding every day protecting them from the bare metal frame but it's totally caused their skin to turn a different color to the rest of their bodies and there's no hair on that area of their back it's just rubbed away. Soon enough, uh, there's going to be busloads of tourists. A lot of these tourists are coming from all over the world. They're on their holidays and they've, they've found this camp online of finding something to do with their, with their time. And a lot of them are actually tour groups. Uh, we're talking 30, 50, 60 people at a time. And at the moment, most of these seem to be coming from places like Russia, China and Korea. So it's really important that we address these kind of tourists as well who perhaps haven't chosen to come to these camps, uh, they're just part of their, their tour itinerary. Now, these elephants have been giving rise every single day uh, without exception. And today, their routine has been broken. They actually didn't get saddled up as all the elephants were getting prepared. Maddie and Kanika were left alone. They already knew something was different. Um, Kanika, the younger elephant, about 30 years old, uh, she was actually a little more nervous, perhaps she didn't know what was going on since the routine was, was broken and she was loaded onto the first truck. I've been on many elephant rescues and getting elephants onto these trucks, uh, depending on the, the situation, the elephant um, can take a very long time, it can take hours, depending on how well you treat the elephant. Of course, when elephants are going between camps, uh, they just hit them with sticks, use the hooks and the nails and get them on quite easily. Now, when you're taken to a sanctuary, 
they don't want any of these things. So we try to coax the elephant on with bananas and treats. If they get too stressed, we just need to let them rest for a bit and, and try again. Luckily, despite being more nervous, Kanika actually went on the truck after a couple of attempts without too much of a fuss. So we were able to get Maddie onto the truck soon after and get started quite early. Many of the rescues that I've been on around Asia are cross-country affairs, taking anywhere from 8 to 16 hours to reach their final destination. Luckily, Phuket's just a small island, so the truck journey takes less than an hour from the camp to the land on which Phuket Elephant Sanctuary is located. Although it's not a very long journey for the elephants, the process of loading and unloading is very stressful for them. So we still try to make it as easy as possible for them and as, as a positive an experience as we can. And although you might not think it, when we arrive, getting the elephants off the trucks is kind of as hard as getting them on. Um, every elephant's different. And surprisingly, Maddie this time, who was the more relaxed, was much more suspicious of where she was going than Kanika. Kanika wandered straight off the truck, um, ate some fruit and off into the field. Maddie took a good five minutes of coercing to get off the truck. Um, she really didn't want to. And it's no surprise. I mean, for the last 60 years, Maddie has been moved from place to place. And it's probably every time she gets off a truck, she's gone into a worse situation than before, or, you know, just as bad. So it's not surprising that she doesn't really want to get off and see what her new situation entails. But after a while, and after a lot of coaxing from the staff, putting down big logs and ramps for her to walk off as calmly as possible, um, she did step off the truck. And she went straight with her mahout out into a, a very quiet field with the sunshine and the wind. Kanika went straight after her and actually veered off right into a patch of banana trees. And that was basically it. It was the first hint of their new lives. And at this point, they probably still don't know what to think. One of the Mahouts uh, is a very old Thai man who had been working with elephants for all his life. He was a, he was a very cool looking guy in, in his sunglasses and his, in his sun hat. And he led Maddie out into the field. Louise Rogerson, who's the founder of Ears Asia, and Lech Chaliot, who's the founder of Save Elephant Foundation, were both here for the, for the first rescue of Phuket Elephant Sanctuary. And they were observing as the Mahout took Maddie out into the field for the first time. He took Maddie out into the field and then he started to uh, tug on the chains that were around her neck. Now these elephants are chained uh, 24 hours. Whenever they're not giving rides to tourists, they're chained by sometimes four feet, sometimes one foot, uh, depending on the elephant and, and the person looking after them. Now, when they're moving, they carry these chains around their necks. It's, they're pretty heavy for humans to carry, so they let the elephants do the work. I didn't know what he was going to do. Perhaps he thought he was still going to chain Maddie up somewhere. But, I mean, that guy, he's been doing it for years. And despite never having seen a, a true sanctuary, he already knew what he was doing. Uh, he knows those elephants. He knows what they can and can't do and, what they, and, how they, and how they think. And he pulled the chains off her neck and he let her go. She immediately started dusting herself down. She's ripping big chunks of grass out of the field and, and throwing mud uh, all over herself. Kanika was still wandering off in the banana trees somewhere, eating as much as she could, which is great to see. Some elephants take a long time to sort of settle into their new lives. One of the elephants I was with wouldn't even eat without being told to. So to see these elephants already know that they're able to sort of do what they want um, was fantastic to see. We followed them for a bit. We kept our distance, uh, watched them eat and, and carry on sort of playing in the mud. It was still a bit tentative and the mahouts were still close by. Don't forget these elephants have just had a very stressful couple of hours being transported here. So they still may be a bit stressed and we don't want to bother them too much. Kanika was still a bit nervous and um, they actually kept a drag chain on her. Now a, a drag chain is a, is a chain, a short chain attached to one of the elephant's legs that will just drag behind them. It's not attached to anything. It's just in case anything happens, the elephant charges or causes some damage, they can hold onto the chain to slow them down. I've seen cases before where some elephants, they had their chains removed immediately after rescue and they just didn't know what to do with themselves. It must be quite disconcerting to, 
to have this chain removed after 60 years that's been on your leg, for some elephants perhaps it's a massive release and for others they're not sure what to do. So they kept this uh, drag chain on Kenika for a couple of hours before it was removed and she had calmed down and, and realized that she was in a very nice place. People do tend to think that you release these animals, you set them free or you put them into a beautiful environment and they just, they're happy, bang, just like that. These animals have personalities and they have minds of their own and you need to make sure each one of them is comfortable. Luckily for Kanika, after a couple of hours, she was comfortable. I've seen elephants that it's taken days before they were comfortable to have their chains off. So it's not as easy as you might think. It's not just the elephants that have the challenge of adjusting to this sanctuary life. Um, the mahouts give up a certain level of control that they're used to over their elephants. They're used to telling their elephants what to do 24 hours a day. And when they're not, they're chained up and they can't do anything. At a sanctuary, they need to learn the new limits of what these elephants are free to do. And of course, these limits are as small as possible. They're not wild elephants. And it's unlikely that any captive elephants in Thailand could be released back to whatever forest is left there. Like most of the other rescued animals that I meet, it was humans who got them into this situation. And now it's we humans' responsibility to give them as good a life as possible since they can't go back to the wild. And that means they still do need limits. But instead of being told when to eat, where to stand, when to sleep, when to move, those limits are much broader and are basically limited to don't damage any humans or buildings. Otherwise, the elephants are free to do what they want. And if you've been looking after this elephant for decades with total control over it, it's a bit of an adjustment to start allowing them to, to do what they want. So it takes a little time for these mahouts to adjust to the new way of life, essentially letting the elephants be their own boss and only intervening when there's danger. One of the mahouts seems to find it a bit difficult to give up control on that first afternoon. He was repeatedly calling Maddie from across the water where she'd gone to destroy a whole bunch of trees. Now, normally you wouldn't want the elephant to go and pull down a bunch of trees, um, but at the sanctuary, that's what they're there for. We watched her doing this for about 10 minutes uh, with the mahout repeatedly calling, Maddie, Maddie and getting a bit frustrated that, that she wasn't paying attention. Mr. Toddan, the elephant owner, came over and, and they had a bit of a chat. And although I couldn't understand Ty, after a minute, they both started laughing. He wasn't really frustrated anymore. He could tell neither the elephant nor he was gonna get in trouble for Madi uh, pulling down these trees. And uh, we all kind of had a big laugh together. And meanwhile, the elephants just ignored us and got on with whatever they wanted to do. So that afternoon, they spent literally hours in the lake without leaving. Uh, Mr. Todd Dan was smiling the entire time, looking like a really proud father. And he was telling us they haven't been submerged in water for 20 years. That lake was overlooked by what would be the visitor's center, which wasn't finished yet when I was there. The idea is that guests just watch the elephants going about their business with no shouting, no commanding, no forcing the elephants to do anything they don't want or go anywhere they don't want. And he knows how happy people can be by just watching these elephants do what they were doing in front of us. You don't need to ride them or anything like this. You just need to see them. Um, everyone there had smiles on their faces. After hours and hours in the water, they went off into the forest for a little bit, uh, breaking down some new trees. And when it started to get dark, we took them to the facilities where they'll spend their first night. So we all agree that elephants should be as free as possible, but they're dangerous animals. They can't be allowed to wander freely in the middle of a city with no supervision at all, unless they're out in the forest where they, they couldn't hurt themselves or hurt others. It wouldn't be long before buildings and cars were damaged and people got hurt and the elephants got hurt. Ultimately, that's what would happen. So how do elephants sleep at night? There's no perfect solution. There's quite a few different ways to keep the elephants safe at nighttime. Now, all of these solutions are compromises, but they're absolutely necessary. Some sanctuaries opt for chaining the elephants on a long chain, maybe 20 meters long, to allow the elephant some freedom to walk around, eat and drink until the morning. Although many people have a knee-jerk reaction to the word chain, this is actually quite standard. And many fans or supporters that have followed elephant sanctuaries for some time will understand this. Their feet are not chained together. It would be a single chain on one leg just to stop them from straying more than 20 meters away. Bear in mind, most of the time, these elephants are resting anyway. It's during the night. 
If you've ever been to an elephant sanctuary, you know how early the day starts in the morning. So it's just a few hours at night. Another option are chain-free corrals, uh, which are usually big electric fences that you may have seen in my previous photo essays at places like Bless in Thailand or Elephant Aid International's work in Nepal. And these also have some pros and cons. Uh, they can be very large, so you can give the elephants a lot more room than the 20 meters they would have on a chain. It also doesn't use the word chain, so there's a lot less knee-jerk knee reactions on social media and such. But some elephants do find it difficult to accept uh, electric fencing. Some of them freak out a little bit. Some of them don't react well if they start testing the fence and get a little shock. Although most do adjust easily. As with any sanctuary, if you've got trees near the fences that could get blown down in a monsoon, you've got to clear that area. So you need quite a huge amount of space if you're going to have chain-free corrals. It's also quite possible for them to break down and they can be broken by the elephants, by trees. I've seen electric fencing being charged through by bull elephants who were having none of it. So they're not as robust. These elephants need to learn not to touch the fencing and to accept it because they know if they really wanted to, they could break through in a few seconds. At Phuket Elephant Sanctuary, they have a different approach. They have some big night shelters. Now these are big kind of like stables for horses where you have a covered area with a big sand pit. You have a big grassy open area with trees for scratching and stuff as well. And they're surrounded by big uh, metal and concrete posts. These are about the height of an elephant. They have huge gaps that, so that humans can walk in and out and so the elephants can see in and out. And they have little pools in their shelters as well for drinking and for bathing. This means the elephants can have enough space and they don't need to be chained. In a place like Phuket, where space is at a premium, you may not have room for huge electric fencing with areas around that where the trees are cleared as well, especially if you're going to try and rescue as many elephants as possible in this little city. So we take the elephants inside and see how they react. They had water, pools, trees and a dust bath. They were quite happy. So in the next few days, the elephants and the mahouts start to get used to their new routine and find out what it does and doesn't entail. And with a couple of days, Madi and Kanika are really relaxed. Although when I was there, they were still not socializing too much with each other. All these elephants at the camps are not allowed to socialize. They're kept completely separately. But within five or six days, they'd kindled this kind of friendship. And now they're absolutely inseparable, following each other around the forest, into the pools. They don't go anywhere alone now. There's a big weight on the shoulders of Phuket Elephant Sanctuary. More than just a place to home elephants, Phuket Elephant Sanctuary hopes to become a model for the existing camps on the island. If the other camps can see how successful a project can be when they treat the elephants nicely and how popular that is with tourists, then hopefully they will copy that model and stop the riding and the hooks and start treating the elephants better. That way all the elephants in Phuket can have a better life. And this means that everything needs to be in place to make sure that visitors from all over the world can learn how elephants should live, regardless of the language they speak, and read. So those tourists from Russia, China, Korea, Japan, that we mentioned before, Phuket Elephant Sanctuary aims to make sure that everyone of any culture or language is given the chance to understand how elephants should really be treated. And they can really start to change attitudes around the world. So for now, these first two rescued elephants continue to accept their new lives. Every day they grow closer together, and they get used to doing what they want in their new sanctuary home. Elephants may never forget, but for Maddie and Kanika, the memories of those trekking camps are getting further away every day. I hope you enjoyed hearing about Maddie and Kanika and their journey to their new lives. I hope you'll join us for the next podcast too. If you haven't had enough of rescued wildlife yet, you can go to my website or Facebook page and get the 2017 The Rescued Calendar, with 50% of the profits going to the Bodhi Shelter, a dog and cat shelter in Phuket. My first photo book is also ready called Five Rescues. That's five rescues with five charities in five countries across Asia with a foreword by the lovely Jill Robinson. And again, 50% of the profits go to the charities in the book. So please check it out. This week, I'd like to thank Douglas White from the UK. And Douglas has supported not only my work for a long time, but also directly supported loads of the charities that I've visited in the past few years. He even helped with a little dog named Gigi, who was hit by a car near my house when I lived in Cambodia. Uh, we put out a call for help for this little thing. The charity that found him, a vet from a second charity, a third charity who helped uh, bring in the money from outside Cambodia to help this little dog 
So, so many people, so many charities working together for this tiny little story um, which had a very happy ending and it warms my heart whenever I think about it and Douglas even helped with little Gigi as well. So thank you so much, Douglas. I hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks for listening and thank you for being a friend to the animals. Music is by Sono Sanctus. Find their website in the show notes as well as my website and my crowdfunding site and links to everything that we've talked about during the show. If you have any questions or comments, let me know at thewildliferescueshow at gmail.com.